A ban on gambling ads before the watershed time of nine o'clock in the evening and outlawing of some gambling machines have been recommended as part of a campaign to tackle serious gambling problems and in particular the problem among teenagers. Is this the right way to go? I'm joined on the line by Mark Smith, clinical psychologist. Mark, good morning. Good morning, Pat. Now, the idea of banning gambling ads before the watershed of nine o'clock, what's your thinking on that? My thinking is this might have been an effective piece maybe 15, 20 years ago when teenagers' consumption of media was predominantly through TV. Um, if I ask a young person now what they watch on TV, usually they'll say nothing because they, they don't see traditional TV as where they get their entertainment. They get it through Netflix or they get it online. So I also wonder about the effectiveness because if we look at what the source of where young people are going to see gambling ads, predominantly it's going to be through sports. So we know that nine of the current premiership teams are sponsored by Ben companies. So we see it on their shirts, we see it on their stadiums. So even if you ban an ad before nine o'clock, if they start watching a game at 7.45, they're still going to be exposed to to mm. ads and to sporting ads endorsed by their favourite football teams or they go into lifestyle sports or another shop, they buy a jersey and it's right over the front of it. And the idea of banning, say, the wearing of shirts on telly, I mean, our telly is sourced from the UK, the Premier League UK. Uh, so although you might have some control of, over local teams, you certainly could not control the Premier League. Uh, you could order the pixelation of the logos on the, the jerseys and that kind of technology is available, but I'm not sure it would go uh, down well with the t- TV platforms or with the, the teams themselves. No, I think the enforceability of that might pose some some legal challenges. And again, it it's looking at all one particular factor, looking at rather than looking at all the different factors that are going to influence young people who engage in gambling. Now, what kind of teenagers would be drawn to this? Is there a profile of the vulnerable teenager? We know from international research that there are certain factors that are likely to increase the risk of a young person engaging in problematic gambling or gambling of any kind. Um, I suppose one are young people who who have left school early. Um, they tend to have less structure in their lives, less predictability, um, maybe are a little bit less hopeful about their future. And young people, by their very nature, tend to be quite impulsive. They look for, for quick fixes and instant solutions to maybe longer term problems. So some may buy into the myths that that gambling is a an effective or, or helpful way to try and earn money, go chasing kind of that that likelihood of that future. We know that young people who are exposed to gambling in the home, so where parents have a positive attitude towards gambling or engage in regular gambling behaviour, they're more likely to see that as something that's that's an appropriate thing to do. So we need to look at those particular factors as, as well as their, their exposure to advertising. Now, what is the high? What is the reward, in other words, from gambling? Well, I suppose with anything, it's it's that the the, the young person sees their tra- young people are attracted to risk. So we know that that they like risky behaviour. That could be from engaging taking alcohol or drugs or or, or gambling behaviour. So what they're seeking is this this high end. And what teenagers tend to do is they overestimate the likelihood of the risky behaviour having a positive outcome, um, and they they, they minimise what the likely impact of that is. So. What we see is that if a young person maybe has a, a positive result with a gambling piece, they, they're conditioned then to think, well, there's, there's an increased likelihood I'm going to get that again. So I'm going to keep chasing that hate. I'm going to keep chasing that that perceived increased odds that, that this is going to work for me. So they think uh, because I know my Premier League inside out that uh, I'm pretty good at predicting um, maybe an accumulator of three results for the final day of uh, the Premiership. Um, and perhaps they don't have the life experience. I mean, the, the old question, uh, where do you where are you likely to see um, a bookie? Is it on a Bentley, in a Bentley or on a bike? Yeah, <laughs> and the and answer is like- in a Bentley. Absolutely. And they're the kind of conversations that, that we need in SBHE. We need it with parents having open and direct conversations about what is the purpose of a gambling company. It is to make money. And as you said, they, they tend not to lose money. So we need to talk to them really openly and clearly about what the odds are and what the risks are um, and really increase the amount of education, both not just the young people, but also to parents about the type of gambling. So we may have some parents that, you know, I keep an eye on from. I know he doesn't go near the bookies, but we know that particularly with teenagers, the most likely 
source of their, their online betting be- or beha- betting behavior is online. So what apps do they have? What have they registered for? Where is their money coming from? So being interested in actually the behavior of young people, mm. and particularly in, in an online way, we need much more robust online verification measures in order to make sure that people who are engaging in, in gambling behavior online are legal to do so. With yeah, the how, how would that be done? I mean, this idea of automated age confirmation, I, I'm not sure how the technology wouldn't allow, you know, an older brother to log on a younger brother, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a, we have to make some attempts to do it. I know yesterday I got an email from the National Lottery asking to, for me to upload either a copy of my driving license or my passport to verify my age. So as as an adult, I'm happy to do that to prove that I'm over 18. But as you said, teenagers are ingenious at finding a workaround. So mm. they borrow their older other brother's ID or their, their dad's ID and suddenly they're, they're betting with that and nobody yeah. knows. So we can't be overly reliant on any one form of, of verification or any one protective measure. We need a suite of them to make sure that we cover as much as we can all the ways that a teenager will find a way around it. Yeah, I'm also wondering about GDPR and, uh, you know, an organisation like the National Lottery asking you, a mature adult, uh, for details that maybe they're not entitled to have. Exactly. And it's also depending on which betting app you're using, what jurisdiction they're in and what they might use that data for. So with a teenager who might see, look, can you upload your ID? Yes, no problem at all. Here you go. They don't know how that data is going to be used. They will, you know, how many of us, even as adults, will scroll scroll down to the end of it? Do you agree in these terms conditions? Yes. How many people read them? Very few. And I would say teenagers, practically none. Mm. So we don't know what that data is going to be used for, how it's going to be used in terms of more, more targeted advertising or who it might be sold to. So there's a lot of implications here and, and we need lots of education of young people about what they're signing up to. Now, you mentioned parents and, and uh, the money that their kids have. I mean, some people might see it as don't give your kids loads of money or they might uh, gamble it or whatever. But if your kid turns up with money that is unexplained, in other words, they go into town and they come back with a very expensive, um, you know, goose down jacket from Canada, Canada goose, or whatever it's called, which yeah. costs hundreds and hundreds of euro. And you know they don't have that kind of money. Your first thing would be they're dealing in drugs. But they might simply be gambling and turn out to be pretty good at it at that phase. Yeah, I think when we're approaching these kind of conversations with young people, the the instinct is to jump straight in with with the judgment. And as you said, like they're dealing in drugs or or perhaps maybe it's gambling. But when you're dealing with a young person, if you go in hot and heavy with an accusation or assumption about where it's come from, what's more likely to happen is the young person will shut down. And they'll take this behavior underground. So when you're approaching this conversation, even if your your anxiety is heightened as a parent, it's about engaging it in, in a curious way in the beginning, um, not making any assumptions and trying to engage with them. Um, if you come in making assumptions, then as I said, they're, they're, they're not going to talk to you. So, But you do need to be curious because if a young person has an expensive jacket like that or has come into money, it's not unnatural to want to know where that has come from. But we need to walk a tightrope between trying to engage them versus trying to shut them down.